Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 120. So, audience here, just <laughs> help me realize that this is actually our 10th year anniversary podcast. Because if you do math. Math, yes. Math. <laughs> and, math. What, and what one was I on the, as I was oh in my the gosh. first year? That was yeah, like, you, what you've been was on that? the podcast, well, here, let's find out. Anyhow, let's, <laughs> before we do that, let's just, let's just introduce who we have here. Guest Robin Dreek and my good friend, Penny Carpenter. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Perry, Christy. Perry Carpenter. Christy. That's right. Christina and, Christy and, and Perry Penny. are interviewing Robin today. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, so for those of you who are listening, the joke was uh, we messed up on uh, Perry's name on our 3,000 schedules that we handed out to DEF CON, and his name is Perry, and we spelled Penny. So um, his whole team at No Before has been ragging on him for... I don't know what the last five six days. Yeah, ever since they saw it. Yeah, and um, and then Perry to to get back at me uh, promoted my books during his speech, which was really kind. But he said you got to read all the books from Christina Hadnagy. So uh, <laughs> deserved. Yeah, deserved. You know, I kind of he's a good looking Christina, that. isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh. Riding that shark wolf. Oh, no, no. That's an Evan thing. Let's yeah. not even talk about that. <laughs> that, was that. That was a great podcast, though, but Evan, Evan perverted that image of that perverted. podcast no. into something scary. <laughs> Have you seen it? No. No. Okay, Evan, I don't want to, but you got to show, you got to show Perry. It's going to go on the... Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but Perry should see it. The only thing know. that would be worse would be seeing Chris in a clamshell. I think that would be great. I mean, personally. Look, here I am searching for... Oh, yeah, that, that's it. That's it, oh, Perry. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You yeah. like WWE. The more I look at it, the more it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> P- now you have PTSD. Yeah. Okay, so I was... Here, look at this. I was trying to answer my quest- your question, Robin, while doing this. Okay, so you were on... It was You were on episode 99. Oh, okay. That was early on. You were on episode 78. Yeah, you were on, man, I think I have you on this show too much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's the fill-in. Look at this. You were on episode 42. There you go. I think that was the first. I don't think that well, was the first. What year was that? And then let's see your first one. You were on episode 20 in 2000. And no, you were on episode 16. Yep. There you go. So, yeah, we've known each other a while. <laughs> Boom. Wow, that was the first one. 2010. Yep, December thirteenth, two thousand and ten. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we've known each other for a while. That. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Yep. So, um, Robin came here this year to talk about uh, sizing people up. <laughs> that's actually, uh, yeah, the next book coming out is called Sizing People Up. You know, started actually the first book. You know that um, Chris has made a cult classic was uh, It's Not All About Me. <laughs> And literally, I don't know if everyone knows the story behind that one. That was actually because Chris called me last minute one week and said, hey, we had a cancellation on our podcast. Can you fill in? And he's like, tomorrow. Or actually, maybe have been this no, afternoon. It, it was. It was that, it was that yeah, afternoon. Same day, yeah, like a Sunday yeah. afternoon. And I go, okay, what do you want me to talk about? And he goes, Psh, I don't know. How do you develop rapport in 10 minutes? And so I literally came up with my 10 techniques to quick rapport. At the same time, a mutual good friend of ours, Joe Navarro, was pumping me to, got to write a book, got to write a book, got to write a book, got to write a book. And so I literally took that, uh, what I did in that podcast, and made it into the first book. Whammo, bammo. And you think I would get royalties since the book idea was my my idea. Yeah, well, you made up for it with unmasking the social engineers like half me. (laughs) (laughs) But I had to get money out of the idea somehow because he wasn't giving me royalties for all the hard work I I put into that. And I had no retribution because he credited me with it at least. That's right. You see? (laughs) See, at least I credit. Yes. I didn't get anything. It was very good. No, but I do, I do, I do, I do promote that book quite a bit. That's good. Oh yeah. So anyway, um, the next. So from there, we went to Dakota Trust because li- life's a continuum. Um, literally, when I first started, you know, teaching and working these things, I really thought it was all about rapport. But once you get really good at rapport, what's the purpose of rapport? Rapport is actually the purpose of it is trust. Because ultimately, you know, what I've learned from Chris, you know, in the world of social engineering, and as you all know, there's. You can't get anyone to do anything without some semblance of trust, whether you're doing a phishing attack or whether you're trying to be a great penetration tester or elicit information when you're doing, you know, capture the flag type stuff. You're not going to get anyone to divulge anything without trust. And so I realized, well, I'm strategizing trust is all I ever did with my behavioral team when I was running with it. And then, then from there, the next continuum became, wow, if I'm actually so focused on the other person to understand how they want to develop trust, I'm actually able to start predicting behavior. And so, you know, it's... 
I call it, you know, sizing people up and it says predicting who you can trust. But ultimately, it's not about who you can trust because trust is based on a lot of people's individual morals and ethics, and which can be all over the place. In other words, just, and, and also people associate liking someone with trusting someone, and you can't. So it's all about understanding what I can reasonably expect everyone's going to do in every situation. And really, because the whole purpose of everything I do is building healthy relationships. Um, I, never need a, the, I never need a quick fix of eliciting information. I'm always looking for a longer term relationship building uh, factor. And the reason why I like sizing people up and what I did in the next book is so if I can understand and reason, reasonably expect what you're going to do in every situation, I know exactly where to set the bar. So you're going to either hit the bar or exceed that bar. So I will never be disappointed in someone's behavior. And now here's what's really good too is because I spent so much time understanding this other person and what I can reasonably expect they're going to do, if for some reason they fall short of that, well, then something's going on in their life. And so now I can reach out and, and, and see if I can be a resource for them and what's going on. So uh, it, it's, yeah, you can use it to, to behaviorally assess people because I have six signs of predictability with like 10 tells per sign. But the whole purpose of it really is to help you continue to foster good, healthy relationships. And, uh, and then, Perry, you came and you, you give a really interesting packed room speech. What was your... Uh speech on here in SE Village? Yeah, so mine was, um, as somebody that's on the autism spectrum, how I've used different social engineering skills, some knowingly and some unknowingly all throughout my life and career to get to the point that I am now. So um, kind of breaking through, understanding things related to rapport and um, even some things that kind of, I, I even had to put a warning uh, before one of the slides because they sound kind of sketchy. They sound kind of premeditated, methodical, and cold when you put them into practice or when you just read them that way. But um, for me, the, the heart was genuine because I did want to build an, ac an actual connection. But um, one of the things that people on the spectrum can deal with is showing emotions well, um, being able to emote well, and then actually feel a genuine connection or, or be able to, to read the other person. So I've, I've learned how to um, kind of, in the most genuine way possible, mimic that and bring that to, uh, to whatever relationship that I'm in. So how many of you have become the DEF CON for like more than five years or so? Yeah, Billy, you? You ever think you'd be sitting at DEF CON hearing speeches about like rapport building and being a, being a, 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 on the autism spectrum, right? <laughs> That's kind of interesting, isn't it, that we've kind of shifted as an industry, like to really start focusing on understanding us as people and how we work and how we think, which I think is pretty fascinating. Uh, it's a nice shift to see that at, at uh, hacker conventions that we're having these open discussions. So one of the things for the format, if you haven't done this podcast before here live, is we have a mic there in the middle. Um, this is o open, open format. So if you've got questions for Robin or Perry and you want to come up and ask, if you can do it in the mic, that would be great because then we get it on the recording and people who are listening can hear that. So anytime you want to say something or ask something, please just come on up to the mic and grab it and, and ask. You know, you know, and you know, to dovetail on what Perry was saying, I have actually had so many people uh, reach out to me because it's a, a method and a procedure, right. you know, for rapport building um, with either Aspergers or um, or somewhere on the autism spectrum, saying that these things help so much. They because do. You make it a process procedure. Matter of fact, th there's this uh, great young guy. Uh, his name's Philip. Um, literally, he reached out to me via LinkedIn. I think uh, probably about six months ago. You know, read read one of my books and said, "Oh my gosh, this helped me so much." He literally just graduated from law school uh, out in Berkeley. And he's constantly reaching out, you know, to communicate with me, and and, and that's why I encourage everyone to do. If anyone ever wants to reach out to me, um, it's probably going to kill me now, you know. But uh, <laughs> but I, I I'm really available, and so he literally reached out to me on the day before he was taking his bar exam, looking for motivation, oh, and nice. you know, to do this. And I'm like, ah, how can I motivate you? The guy speaks six languages. He's about to take the California bar exam, and I said, how the hell can I, you know, motivate you? And he's like, I'm really nervous, really nervous. I said, well, you know, are you passionate about what you do? And he goes, very passionate. I said, well, you're you're not about to take a test. You're all you do is about to share your passion with a bunch of people that can't wait to pass you. You know, because one thing I, I love about what we do, you know, and whether you're sitting in a booth or, or you're speaking to large audiences, like mm -hmm. you were talking, Perry, you know, you know how you struggle sometimes with small rooms or right. large audiences for some people. It's we have the ability to shift our context about how we see the world around us. You know, I mean, just the other day, you know, when we kicked off the speaking thing, and I had, you know, we had sitting room only in the front, you know, for the, you know, for, you know, uh, my speech the other day. 
some people could get nervous at that because you, everyone's always feeling they're going to be judged, but it's actually not. You have the power to say, instead of, you know, I have a thousand people about to judge me. No, all I'm about to do is have a great conversation with a bunch of friends. Yeah. You know, and that's what it is because if people are around you, it's, it's nothing but a conversation with a bunch of people that can't wait to hear you share your information and share your knowledge. Yeah, I agree. So one of the things that um, if you're ever on a stage like this or you're put in a position where you're leading a round table, um, people want you to succeed. I, that's yeah, what I had absolutely. To, to realize is if they put you there and you're on the stage, they don't want to have this excruciating 45, 50 hour long time of somebody that's just struggling. They, they want that person to succeed, so they're behind. They also believe that you're there for a reason and that you're an expert and that you have something valuable to share. Otherwise, they wouldn't be filling the seat. So everybody's on your side and it is um, a conversation. So if you can look out, um, you can get a lot of feedback from the audience that's valuable on where you can take the next piece. That's a really valuable point. And I think especially like in the different, so such different topics, when you look out in the audience, you can really connect with people who are staring at you like, oh my gosh, I identify. Like I was sitting over here with a group of people during your speech, and every time you would talk about some discomfort you had in your mm -hmm. life, there was just like these people were just like doing this. And I'm like, yeah, they identify. Oh, yeah. you like, I was hearing you, and I, I, I don't have the same issues. So I, was, I hear you, and I'm like, wow, that's really interesting to hear that. But those people were identifying with your yeah. feelings, your emotions. And I'm like, yeah, you're connecting with, you know, all sorts of different people. It makes it really easy, yeah. too. I mean, whenever I, I, I love speaking, you know, in large audiences, I mean, because what you do is as you're scanning, what, what are you looking for? I'm looking for smiles. I'm looking for head right. tilts, yep. nods, and smiles. I'm looking for the yep. positive encouragers. I remember years ago uh, when I was doing a lot of undercover work uh, in New York when I was with the FBI, someone asked me, so, you know, you have, a, you, you have a big room full of people that you need to go engage. How do you, how do you choose who to engage? I said, that's the easiest thing in the world. Look for someone who's smiling. Yeah, because these are the people, you know, like even the other day, you know, doing yeah. the capture the flag stuff, you know, the, the first thing, remember, uh, I can't remember who it was, you know, uh, the receptionist that gave a giggle. Yeah. You know, I said, yeah. you hang up that phone, talk it from anywhere else, go back to the giggle girl. Yeah. Nice. Because there's someone who's looking forward to engage. Yeah. You know, so I'm always looking for those positive uh, social encouragers that you're going to see, you know, head tilt, nod, smile. Yep. So I, you, I've done the same thing. So one of the things that I learned uh, several years ago was street hypnosis. Are huh. really informal, and so <laughs> you you can also if you're starting to think about like stage hypnosis, you can tell who some interesting people might be because as soon as you bring up the word, they're going to lean forward and they're going to start mm -hmm. you know really trying to soak in. It's like all right, if I'm going to do an experiment, I might want to find those few people and start with them rather than the big process that everybody else always goes Absolutely. through. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I can tell you exactly where Stephanie sat the entire time because she was the big one right there. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling nonstop. Big personality going. Yeah. I think we have a question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, sizing people up and uh -huh. building trust digitally. You're never going to meet this person face to face. Sure. So uh, how does that work? It's uh, actually, it believe it or not, I think it's easier. Um, so I, when, I, when I have a longer than 50 minutes, you know, when I, I do my full, you know, like two, three, four hours, matter of fact, if you come to SE Village in Orlando, you'll see some of this. <laughs> um, what I have is I actually demonstrate through emails exactly uh, my methodology for making sure that every single statement I make is completely about the other person. When you're doing it live, it can be challenging because you've got to really slow yourself down. But, and I said it during my talk the other day, what you basically need to demonstrate in everything you say, either verbally or in writing, Every single statement has to make, be about the other person where you're demonstrating affiliation and you're demonstrating their value. And the way you do that is every single statement has to either seek their thoughts and opinions, talk in terms of their priorities, validate those priorities and who they are as human beings without judgment, and p empower them with choice. Um, you know, so, so a great example, so I'll use, just use my kids. So uh, there was an instance a number of years ago, my son's a sophomore in high school, and uh, one of the teachers had misgraded an exam of the entire class, and we think it was the wrong grading key. And she was really dug in, she's not changing her mind. So my son, uh, my wife asked me, said, Dad, can you help? I said, sure. What's our goal and objective? She said, how can we inspire her to want to check the grading key? And so I said, all right, craft, you know, put together an email you want to send, and all I'm going to do is go line by line and make sure that every statement's about her. And they had, a, they had an opening statement that was okay. You know, it said something to the effect that, you know, Kevin really enjoys your biology class. And I said, Kevin, do you? And he said, yes. I said, why? He said, because I like how she expands upon the material and make it about real life scenarios. I said, so that's good. That's a specific validation of one of her priorities because she said it at the beginning of the year. But the next statement was, Kevin was disappointed in his midterm grade. 
there's not one thing in that statement that is about the other person. And so what I added to it was, you know, Kevin was really excited to take the exam because he wanted to demonstrate his passion for science like you, you know, said you wanted to share in the beginning of the year. And he was hoping he would have done better on his midterm grade. What do you think you might be able to do uh, to maybe work with him in extra, in extra credit? So all I was doing was validating her, seeking thoughts and opinion, and empowering her with choice. So I added that into the statement, which made it about her. Long, the other yeah. interesting thing that you did there is you didn't invalidate the fact that she was digging in. You didn't say, I think Absolutely. you used the wrong key. You said, is there something extra he right. can do? And so, what, yeah, and so it was really funny. So the whole theme of the entire email was seeking her thoughts and opinions about what he can do to improve himself. Yeah, that's great. And so it triggered her to want to take a look at his, his test score to actually see what he got yeah. wrong. And so he went from a 69 and the rest of the class had failed to a 99 and got one wrong because now she went back and checked the grading key because we, because again, I talked about it in my speech also, I'm never about convincing people to do things because convincing is about what we're trying to get someone to do. How can we inspire her yeah. to want to? So we made, that's why I'm always thinking in terms of inspiring people for things because when you inspire someone to do something, it means it's about them, about their priorities, and you're talking in terms of that. You took the defensiveness away. Absolutely, because people are, you know, every, here's a guarantee in life. You know, there's so many guarantees with human beings. I can guarantee what every human being is going to do every single minute of the day. You're always going to act in your own best interest. Safety and security and prosperity for yourself is our number one genetically and biologically coded thing. It's just up to us to understand what they think is in their best interest. And one of the things that people will always talk in terms of is their own priorities. You know, we had all this dopamine and oxytocin conversation yeah. going before, which is really, really pure. Because when we're talking about ourselves and sharing our own thoughts and opinions, which is roughly 40% of every day, our dopamine's being released. So great individuals that build healthy, trusting relationships takes that 40% and gives it over to the other person and seeks those thoughts and opinions, talks in terms of their priorities, validates them without judgment, and empowers them in choice. I mean, even when, uh, I make, when I was still working with the FBI, one of the last statements I'd always leave someone with that I did a first contact with, who I'm hoping to what might be do, want to do something patriotic, I'd always say, um, and if you never don't want to hear from me again, please let me know, and I'll make a little note never to bother you. You know, I always let everyone completely off the hook, and I've never had anyone say, good, get away. Why? Because that entire conversation was completely about them. I mean, one of my favorite questions ever is, think about the healthiest relationships, the strongest relationships you have. You know, even right now, just listen, listening, think about it. When, during that last conversation you had with the best friend in your life, either your spouse or anyone, just great, strong relationship, how often during the last conversation did you seek their thoughts and opinions, talk in terms of what was important to them, validate those thoughts, opinions, and ideas and who they are without judging them, and if appropriate, gave them choices. Anecdotally, I say roughly five to 10%. Now, when you increase that to 100%, how strong do you think that relationship is gonna get? That's why people, when you offer them an opportunity to walk away from you, they never will. Because you get their dopamine flowing more solid than anything else. And the cool thing is, you know, on my side, I don't lie, I don't use deception, I, because I have found, you know, it's easy to do a licitation, you know, why, why you, you know, omit things in your life and you use an intentional misstatement and everything. But if you have time and you can benefit from that longer relationship, I'll, I'll, I never use deception because when, once, once, once it's discovered or, or even suspected, it'll, you'll never go anywhere. <clears throat> I can't stay away from the microphone. You know me. So um, along the lines of those you, thinking, you, when, no. what? <laughs> what? I, I don't need a microphone. You know I'm loud. <laughs> yes, yes. But along the true. lines of those thinking, like serious question here, um, when I told people I was part of this competition and kind of what it's about, I would often get accused of, well, you, you're just manipulating people. All you're doing is like you're just being manipulative. And in, even like talking to people at the conference when they found out I was part of the social engineering village, they get a little bit like, oh, I don't want to talk to you. So right. like what's your response to that? Like, you know, as far as like, you know, using in, in business or interpersonal relationships, you know, how do we if how do we address that when people are like you're just being manipulative almost in a really negative connotation all the time? So I'll give mine and then. You know, if you want to, because I'm, I'm taking all Chris's time. Sorry, Chris. Um, so, and I, I struggle with that. Matter of fact, when I, my first book, it's very manipulative. And here's what I mean by that. So, if you're controlling time, thoughts, or actions of another human being, you're manipulating them. So, first, come to grips with that. Because, you know, in the booth the other day, we were manipulating. But... In order to get the skills and tools and techniques we need to, in order to protect people, we need to understand what these things do and the effect of them. Because, you know, we, you know, we did no harm, we did no foul. And what, and what mitigates manipulation is transparency. That's why I love, you know, after, you know, the time in the booth, you know, going through these exercises, Chris publishes everything. 
So that's transparency because transparency and open honest communications mitigate any attempt of control of anyone because you're saying, hell, here's what we did. You know, if you want to learn from us, you know, if the company even wants to reach out, you know, and see what, you know, what information was gained, if you want any education on it, because that, so great transparency and openness mitigates any of those attempts. But yes, in, in order to understand the effect that people have using these techniques negatively, you actually have to practice them and understand them. Um, so that's what I'd say, yes. In those, in those moments when you're not having open eyes communication, it is manipulation, there's no doubt. But the purpose of it is what? To get the skills needed so you can understand it so then you can use it for good and protecting of others and when you do it with an open format like that, it mitigates, so. Does that answer that? Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, I agree mostly. I mean, we, we, we um, maybe differ on the definitions between influence and manipulation, but... Um, oh, I'd say it's influence then, yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think when you look at your intent, like what am I doing this for? So if I, if I saw you and you were a target and I came across that my intent was to steal something from you or to you know, get something that's one-sided from you, that to me feels very manipulative, but if I'm, if I'm just having a conversation, you know, I mean, the, the, the end goal of the competition is education. Yep. And it's not about proving, you know, we say this all the time, it's not about proving that Sally or Joe, whoever you were speaking to is dumb. That's not the goal. But if that was the goal, we'd be going for flags about that person, you yeah. know, who they are, right. where they live, what their kids' names is. And that's not what we're doing. We're, we're asking about the company. We're saying, are you training your people enough to recognize? And remember that one call? The lady yelled out, you're a liar, and oh, that hung was so up. Good. <laughs> I mean, and she didn't even have a conversation. So what did that tell us about that company? The previous conversation probably caught on to him and then shot an email out to the whole organization saying, there's something going on. This guy, whatever he would name he was using, this guy named Dave is calling, and he's... Rob Green. The Rob Green, that's what it was. Rob uh, Green, you're a damn liar. Yeah, that's what, he, <laughs> that's what the lady said. So he was using Rob Green on every call, and she emailed out probably to everyone, this guy named Rob Green is calling, and he, he's not who he says he is. That was a drop-the-mic so, moment forever. Oh, it was great. Yeah. As soon as he picked up and said, hey, this is Rob Green, she's like, like you're response. a liar. And clicked. Nice. Now, that is a, to me is a great lesson, right? Because that company was doing it right. So whatever they were doing, they taught their people exactly what should be done. And that's going to go into the report that Rob is talking yeah. about. That we actually saw companies this year for the first time that were doing the things that we want companies to do. Right? We want, I want every one of my clients to be that company. Yeah, I thought it was a fascinating study, yeah. you know, because, you know, the... the the industries that you chose, you know, we actually saw, you know, were actually, some of them are pretty buttoned up, pretty dang good. I mean, it, it, it was funny, it was, for, for some of the contestants that, you know, didn't do as well, it wasn't because they didn't do well, it's because they actually had a company that was just really, really good. Yeah. Um, and either, and also most of the, we saw in some of the alcohol ones, they get off at two o'clock during the summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one beer company, their hours, their summer hours are seven to two. And it's like, oh my gosh, we got to work there. And, and that's actually a good, we should, we should mention this because I usually do that on the, on the podcast here at DEF CON is the theme this year was uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm companies. So if you weren't in the room for that, it wasn't the ATF as in the government agency. Uh, somebody actually mentioned that, I think, on Twitter. Like, no, 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 that's the wrong thing to say. Because that's what you said. <laughs> that is true. I did say that. No, I didn't say that. I didn't know. I didn't say it was the a I said it was a ATF, the theme. And someone was like, the agency? And I'm like, no, no, no. So, that, that. so we were doing alcohol, tobacco, and firearm companies. And, uh, yeah, day one we saw there was a lot of them that were buttoned up really tight. And they were not giving us information regardless of the pretext. Um, and then we saw a large number of, uh, I think this is like a correlation we see every year, when contestants come with a ton of numbers to call. So those who come on the stage and they have a you know, hundred numbers on their sheet, they generally do really good in the calls because if we get burned in one location, we can move to another or they have many places to call if we're getting hang ups or no answers. And then generally those who call, come with like four or five numbers, those are the ones where we're sitting here for 20 minutes going, ooh, this is going to be rough. Especially if we get the Rob Green, you're a liar. You know, thing. That was <laughs> so, so good. It's just over at that point. You know, they're telling everyone in the company there's nothing you can do. So it was, uh, a, it was a, a fascinating year. Maybe the first since we have been doing this for a decade that we had that much shut down. Did you know. notice any trends between those three industries on which one seemed more buttoned down? You know, it was interesting. The first day, 
I made a comment that it seemed like um, that al alcohol was the most prolific, tobacco was next, and then the, the firearms industry was giving us nothing. But that got disproved on day two. Right. Mm -hmm. On day two, everything changed. Uh, we didn't see the same the same trend. So I don't I don't I don't know yet without analyzing all of the the stats what uh, what we, what we will see yeah. you know when cool. we look at it. But I don't think there was one industry that was failing constantly. I think it was uh, interesting. The one you know the I think the people that stood out the most that were the most open uh, were either the ones that worked from home. Um, because they didn't have as much connection uh, yeah. with others, and, and I, you know, the, the the connection of recently giving birth to someone I thought was oh, really good, man. and and then uh, hitting good old boys from the Midwest, I thought that was really you know, easy going as well. You know, get getting an older gentleman on the phone that didn't quite understand how this computer thing and like electronic devices worked, and he's being walked through it by us on the phone. I thought that was uh, good. Um, it's, you know, basically you get good open people on the phone uh, with their guards down and. Uh, yeah, people was, that want to help. Yeah, yeah. It, it, actually, that's yeah. exactly what it came down to. And I really loved the theme too about the job search. I thought that was really effective. Yeah, because that made it about them and what they're trying to do. You're using an, 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 an assistance theme, which all human beings respond to because of our genetic coding, and they made it about them by seeking their thoughts and opinions. Again, you know, go keep going back, seek thoughts and opinions of others, talk in terms of their priorities, validate them, and empower them with choices. So I thought the theme was good. Yeah, we we did. We had some interesting pretext this year. Um, that I think we're, we're also um, somewhere a little different from previous years. So it will, be, it will be cool to look at the data and to see which ones really had high effects on people and which ones didn't. Uh, again, I think what we saw was internal employees' pretexts tend to be the, the best. They tend to be the ones that, that make people the most comfortable. But the one that Robin was talking about, I thought it was great because when this guy got on the phone, uh, he actually didn't sound like he was going to be helpful. He sounded a little bit like, almost like, why are you calling me? And then he said, look, I'm not really even at work because I'm on paternity leave. And you can hear his kids screaming in the background. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> and then the contestant, she said, oh, I just gave birth to my, my baby three months ago. And it was a literal tonal change. It was like, oh, congratulations. And now they're in this tribe of new parents. Yep. And he was just like, okay, let me boot my computer. It wasn't even on. So let me boot my computer and answer every flag you have. I mean, basically, nice. it was like literally she was just like flag, 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 flag. I'm like, what is happening? You could literally sit there and say, give me more flags. I'm yeah. good. Anything you want. Yeah, she could, she could have been like, hand me a new list because I'm done. It was unbelievable. Which, which you know, was striking me because it's my first year witnessing this, and you know, we make a we make a really big deal about the ability to communicate in the booth and just being great, you know, listeners of information. But the thing that struck me is, you can teach a lot of people to do those kind of things, and if you're just being true to yourself, you know, as we were talking with Stephanie. But I thought the most striking thing was the people that did the best had the most accurate phone numbers. The OSINT that went behind it, like yeah. the stuff I can't do, that I thought was really impressive. So it definitely is, a, you know, to be effective at doing this, you need a great blend of your ability to do research and then your ability to employ that research um, productively. So I thought it's it just not one skill. You have to be the master of both. And our top three um, contestants, the, the first place, second place, and then the third place winners, all had within a 30-point spread of their report scores. All, all like so the top the the um, the top report score this year was a perfect score. Wow. It was 220 points. Yeah, she was she got every flag that could possibly be got, and the and she the professional writing of the report. It was like bedtime reading of joy. I mean, <laughs> and, Chris said he cried. I did. I did. I, I teared <laughs> when I got an email because I you know first it was a huge file, so it was like you know like a 10 meg. PDF and I'm like, whoa, what is this? And I open it and right away I see like, you know, page one of 127. And I'm like, oh God. So, you know, I, like, usually when I see that, it's like people, what they've done is they went to like Facebook pages and copy and pasted. And I'm like, this is going to be horrible. But the first page, I'm like, oh, this is really well written. And the second page is really when I'm like, she, she knows how to write. And then, and then she did some crazy things like, Social media pages, right? Go to the employee's social media pages, and they're like, hey, look, mom, got my new job, click. And she would zoom in on the background, which was their computer screen, and circle the icons in the taskbar. Oh, so they have Chrome open. Oh, they use Outlook. Like, this is how she got the flags. And I'm like, what a genius way. Like, not just looking for someone saying it, but 
analyzing the pictures yeah. that they would post and then getting the flags by looking at the icons or looking at their desktops or what type of badges identifying the badge it just it was she was she mind was, blown it was i i found not just with her but a few of y'all on that did it the most effective technique for eliciting is use what i call you must be uh, you must be this you must be mm-hmm. that. in other words an intentional misstatement because then if you're not asking questions then which are alerting they're making statements and either the person will either validate the statement or correct you and so that's what um, you know. That's what the good OSINT folks were doing. They were making statements. So so you must be on your Dell computer right now. Yes. You know. Then they'd either validate it and correct it. There's the flag. You know. You know. You must be using Chrome again today. Oh no, you're not you're using. So, so it's, again, they're not asking questions. They're making statements. And the human condition we all have is we want to correct others. We have an incessant need to correct other people. So that's what they were playing on, which is great because they did that great research. And it worked really well. Yeah. It worked really well. So. Actually, you know, we'll just tell you, small group here, we're a black badge contest again this year. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, Alith is our first place winner. And nice. uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Joe is our second place winner. Yeah, thanks. That's either uh, they're yeah, not here, huge. but really, really excited. So this is another year with um, with two two women, two women. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie won though. Who was third place? Oh, third place was Ruben. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it was so close between Ruben and Joe that it was it was like it could. I said to a man, if you had just like literally sped up that last call and got one more flag, it had been a bit of a different story here, you know, because um, it, it was literally that close. It was like a few points away, which is always worse. I don't want to lose. <laughs> I'd rather lose by like a landslide, yeah, right. you know, because then it's like, yeah, yeah, you really beat me. But like when it's two points, I'm like, all I had to do was one thing. Like now <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm ticked at myself, you know. I could have. I should have hung up that phone with that other person quicker, yeah. or, or just yeah. or stop, or let it not ring as long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> always that. The next one. And you know, it's a, it's a it's a unique vantage point because they're in this booth and there's 20 minutes, and that's a lot of pressure, right? I mean, you know, when we do vishing professionally, we have endless amounts of time. We can take as many breaks as we want. You can get up and walk around. You can refresh yourself. And there's not 700 or 1,000 people watching, you know. So you get people in this booth, and they have all these people watching, and there's so much stress. And then you have, you have like, Shelby sitting up there with a the clock or whatever, you know, like, with this timer counting down in your face. And the pressure, it's, it's just so much. It, that As you keep dialing numbers and no one's picking up. Yes. <laughs> and that's the worst. I think yeah, we that had that happen a few times. So it was, um, yeah, th- this year th- to have, again, the, the more proof, two women taking the top slots that happened again last year. I think since uh, it's been now six years that we've had women dominating this competition. I mean, not we had we had a couple guys win, but they're always in the top three or four. Um, or taking the winning place, which is great to see. Yeah, and it's fascinating, too, because, you know, going back to, you know, some of the techniques for building that rapport, you know, the second technique I talk about is accommodating nonverbals. And our vocals are nonverbals as well. And so, you know, you had, you know, two women that had a great vocals that were going, and then Ruben, his nonverbal vocals were yeah. very smooth. Very, yeah. you know, and that's why, you know, anytime you can stay as close to the truth in your own life as you can, there's less ums, there's less pauses. You know, when you're asked a question, you're very fluid with the answer. And that's what exactly what he was doing. He was being real to himself. And so his nonverbals vocally were spot on. So you're not alerting to other people. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, even just doing what I, I did for a career with trying to recruit people. You know, if you come in there, you know, say, hey, I need you to do this. And you're showing a lot of tenseness in your voice and aggressiveness. It's like, oh, geez, for, forget it. I don't want to work with the government. I don't want to do anything. But as, as you kind of go in or kind of, kind of lackadaisical, hey, if you want to do this, great. If not, I'm fine. You know, whatever you want, it's completely about you. You know, that's when you get people to want to engage because you, you obviously are taking it easy. It's not a big deal. Um, and, yeah, this is just a thing that everyone does. And so when you're non-verbally kind of casual like that, um, you're less alerting. So I, th- those top three were definitely like that. Yeah, there's something primal in that. I mean, because you seen this, you see the same reaction with dogs. You know, yeah. People go yes. to a dog and they're all tense the, yep. the dog reflects that back but the looser they are the, and, and our vocals definitely display tenseness or non-tenseness yeah yeah I'm always tense <laughs> 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 and then uh, we had Mission SE Impossible here too and uh, our winning our winning person was um, was a young lady who did it in a minute and 27 seconds which was amazing she got out of handcuffs leg cuffs picked a lock, read three facial expressions, and then traversed the laser grid in a minute and 27 seconds. So 
Yeah, it was it was quite a quite an interesting year. Nice. I, I was like so before that we were hitting like three minutes, four minutes. We were hitting a bunch of different times, and then um, we had one guy get up and he did it in a minute and forty seven seconds, and and I was like, whoa, that's the time to beat now. And um, yeah, she got up and just completely nailed it. She also was the single lifeline for every person that couldn't pick the lock. She would jump up and like I don't. She was magic. She was like she would touch the lock and go. And literally, I don't know what she was doing. She would put a rake in and go like this, and it would just turn. I'm like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, someone to keep away from your stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, someone you want as a friend, not an enemy. Yes. That's for sure. You don't know? touch my things. Yeah, she she was she was great. She was really great. So. Um, that, that was an interesting. She probably just remembered to go counterclockwise. It seemed like there were a lot of people that. Oh were, my gosh! Yeah, right. We had this. We had this. So we had this big sign on top of the lockbox that says "Go counterclockwise" because previous years we had people, and I mean we even drew arrows. We even drew arrows to say like this is the direction, and we had one guy get up there and like put the tension wrench in, and treat it like a crowbar, and he turned the lock upside down. I'm like. Oh. Like, oh, my gosh, this is ridiculous. But, yeah, we tried. We tried to make it as easy as possible uh, with that. Yeah, so it was a good year. I mean, um, Thursday we were on one of two villages that were open. So, um, Which I, made it, me look like a rock star. Yeah. yeah <laughs> nice. you, you are. But it was interesting because we had so many people in this room. I thought when I, when I walked in here uh, Wednesday to set up, I'm like, there's no way we're filling this room. I mean, this room is like, you know, if, how many of you were here last year? Okay, so you know double the size, right? This room is double the size from last year. And I'm like, yeah, we're, we're, we're just going to, it's going to be good. We'll be almost full. Um, but Thursday, there was people sitting on every square foot of carpet that we had. That, that was, that, that blew my mind. And then uh, Friday, I, I thought, okay, well, that's just because we're the only ones open. But then Friday, it was like the same thing. People were just pouring in here. It was, it was crazy. It was, what a good year. And difficult, too, because... Four hotels, right? It's four, like four hotels. Do you guys get? Yeah, four. Yeah, you have to walk all over the universe just to get to different places. These funky little badges are everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I had a guy. Um, I had a guy that came in and he said someone told him there was something else here, some kind of contest, and he's like, "Isn't that here?" And I'm, I'm like, "No, man, that's not here." And then we pulled the map out, and it was like in the flamingo, and I'm like, "I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry." Hey, good, good news. It's only 106 today. It was 113 yesterday, so, you know. But it was a dry heat. But it was a dry heat. <laughs> and the locust plague left. So I guess that's good, right? I mean, it's not the book of Revelations anymore, so we're okay. It's because I mean, you, sh- you showed up, Chris. We do it? have flooding in the room, so I'm not sure what, yeah. what that says, you know. It's a little little crazy. Um, but, yeah, we had, we had some great speeches this year. Speaking track in SE Village was just phenomenal. Um, and I think, I don't know, what do you guys think? But we, this year we ended 40 minutes earlier than normal. And I still think it was maybe a little bit too late. Right? But I'm, I'm just curious because, like, what you all think. Because it was, we were ending, like, at 8 or something last year. And then this year we ended at, like, 7.20. And I just see that last speech, people are, like, getting hungry and they want to go out to dinner. So it was anxious to stand in line to get on the elevators. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Those elevators were nuts. I literally think I saw 100 people come off one one morning. It was like a clown car elevator. Wow. That, that sounds like a safety violation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about, you know, our, our, our little thing we do. We're getting people to turn around in the elevator. I was literally standing on that one. I said, there's no way you could get 100 people to switch around in the face of rear. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you could make the move because they probably were packed they were, in there they with were, sardines. They were shoulder to shoulder, man. Yeah. Oh. So uh, do we have any more, question, any more questions or? Yeah, hit it up so we get it on the recording so people listening could. So I, I love the, I mean, the whole security through education and the positive, the positive, I guess, culture or idea behind the social engineering, in in our company though it, it's or in, again probably multiple companies, there's this culture of our data is more important than training the people and I I have a hard time siding with any of the the stick the the termination because you you clicked one too many times. Do you have any, I guess, ideas on how to, I guess, help influence that type of, uh, I guess, a more positive culture regarding security education? That's, a, that's, a, that's an awesome question, by the way, Lee, and also a very 
loaded question because <laughs> you should have asked that like 40 minutes ago so we had the whole time to talk about it. <laughs> um, you know, the, the interesting part is I think, and Perry would probably agree with this with what No Before does, um, we see that, that culture and attitude prevalent everywhere in companies mm -hmm. uh, because you can protect data with a blinky box. Right, so all you need to do is just put a box in the network and data is protected. Until so, the person gives it away. Right, right. unless, yeah. unless the person mm -hmm. gives it away. Um, and a culture change, this is not the answer you're looking for, but this is the start. The culture change has to start from the top down. You can't start it from the bottom up. Yeah. So if, you're, if, you, if you and your company are at the bottom, you wanting that, sadly, is not going to do much because you have no power, right? The, the culture change in every company I've worked with that we saw massive shifts in that thought process, it came because someone in the top went, we need that attitude, what you just said. We need to be more yeah. security conscious. And then they start making that effective change. Because if you start from the bottom up, what ends up happening is eventually you hit that one manager that just hates your guts. And then it all goes, it all falls down. But when you start from here, no one can argue. Yeah, Do you see yeah. the same thing, Perry? Yeah, I um, absolutely agree. And the, the other thing I'd add just on the, the stick piece is that organizations that use the, the stick just kind of blindly um, probably don't understand some of the psychological components related to phishing. Because if you're trying to, to deal with a behavior umbrella, like I don't want my people susceptible to phishing, um, you can make it them to where they're not susceptible to typos and that they know how to look at the header, <laughs> but you hit them with a different psychological yep. hook, yep. then it's different. And clicking on a link is different than downloading an attachment, not submitting credentials is different than not. BEC is different than all of the above. 100%. And so if, if you're blindly saying, if this person falls for three phishing emails, then they're out of the company, it, mean, it could be that you're hitting different psychological things that you need to train on and you've actually probably got seven or eight different behaviors that you need to work through. And, th and then I take it from the uh, from an overarching st um, thought process and that is, you know, definition of crazy. And that is, you know, if, if your company keeps getting scammed and keeps getting taken advantage of, then keep on doing the same thing. You will not get a change in your results. And so if you, if you don't right. like the results of what we're doing, you know, that we're getting hacked a lot, well then, you got to change something up. And so then you empower them with choices. Well, we can do training, we can do this, we can do this, because if we don't change something we're doing, it's going to continue to happen. It's just a guarantee. And, and think about it, you fire a, a person for failing, you replace them with another human. Starting are they at ground now all zero, of a sudden, right, with no training. Yeah, no training. They're, are they all of a sudden superhuman and they're not vulnerable? And that's, it's, it's, so the, the follow-up to my, that's not the answer you want, is that if you have that thought and you have any power at all, it's making that argument with the people in power. Is that it's better to keep the human there that can be trained than to keep replacing the humans that are just gonna bring in more vulnerability. So it, it's, you know, and, and then the, the ROI is what they need to see. So let's use phishing training since, you know, we have Perry and I do the same thing up here. The, the ROI for anyone in power is let's look at that those metrics and it's not click ratio. Perry nailed it. It's not click ratio is useless. I'm just going to change the tactic and you're going to fall for it. Um, the, 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 the ratios are how many people are reporting these? How many people are reporting these and either clicking or not clicking? Let me show you that statistic and that's ROI. Because if I can show that that reporting stat's going up every month, you're spending your money wisely. Click ratio is stupid. Who cares about it? Right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's another component to this that um, people making purchasing decisions seem to ignore or just be blind to, which is firewalls, secure email gateways, endpoint protection, they, they all have a failure ratio involved. And you look at the money that people are spending on those technologies that have natural gaps in effectiveness that we're extremely aware of. And they're not willing to say, all right, well, let's up our security awareness budget by however many percent because they feel like it's a losing game. Well, you've already proven that the technology has a gap as well. So why not try something different? What's the worst that could happen is, oh, you, you upped it by, you know, 200 percent. And now you're spending 50,000 a year as opposed to, to, to whatever. Um, you're, you're spending a lot more on the blinky lights things that... <laughs> have already shown to have some weaknesses. We have another question. All right, so 
For somebody like me, who has a teaching and psychology background, what sort of company should we sort of pursue to look to if we were getting into this field? As a job, you mean? As a or, job. So you want, to, you want to do a career change? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a question, I think. I don't know if you get that all the time, Perry, but we, we get yeah. that question probably like once every week through mm -hmm. email. Um, because this, you know, look, this is a great field to be in, and it seems to well, right now at least be like recession proof and stuff. So it really depends on, um, and maybe Perry, you'll have a different answer, but it really depends on what you want out of the future. But you need to f find a company that will allow you to use the skill set you already have and apply it to um, one area of probably in info security or cyber security. So. I, when people say they're teaching and, and psychology, uh, my mind automatically goes to social engineering. Of course, I'm a little biased. But um, companies that do security awareness training, and I'm not talking about CBTs, right? Because CBTs to me is not security awareness training. Uh, unless you apply it with something like, like what, what No Before does, right? So you fish a person, and then you educate them. That's a great way to use those, those tools. But just slamming people with 20-minute videos, it's not going to make an effective change. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. The, I mean, the context of somebody's life and their, their psychological position at the time is the key to whether a CBT or a video or exactly. any other kind of interventive tactic is going to work at the time. So if you say you've got a teaching background and a psychology background, mm -hmm. there's great potential for you on the SE side. There's great potential for you on the awareness design side because it is all about understanding population groups and figuring out the best intervention for a population group at any given time. And, and all of that comes down to training that you have that most of us in the security field are, are blind to. And so you bring an immense amount of value into either of those two contexts. And, and a great way to do it is by coming to conferences like this, bringing a stack of business cards and handing them out to companies that you hear that you like and you say, hey, if you're ever looking to hire, you know, like, bam, here I am. Uh, that, you, know, you don't want to blank at DEF CON with your business cards. That's a bad idea. Um, but, you know, <laughs> listen, listen. Yeah, yeah, my name is, and here's my phone number. Please don't hack me. You know, then you're going to be on the wall of sheep. And that may be like a Stephanie different Like Stephanie gave kind. out her cell phone you know, number the other day. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> people like Stephanie do that. But, you know, normal people don't. I, mean, I don't mean that you weren't normal. But, you know, you don't want to do that. At, Stephanie's got a DEF CON drop phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. But, um, but you know, when you, when you listen to speeches or people talk and you're like, oh, that company sounds like something that resonates with me, that's a great time to be like, hey, here's me. Let's have a conversation sometime. Um, I've hired people because of that, right? Because I met them at a conference. I've got a card, watched them grow, listened to some things they do, read some articles they wrote, and like, yeah, hey, this actually can work. And I'm sure so, no before has done the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so here's the thing that I would do, too, is um, if you're interested in social engineering or just what's technically called awareness, which I, I know we all know is broader than that, but that's the market term. Um, <laughs> Go out and, and look, and when you see things that say, well, you need five years of security experience or 15 years, kind of ignore that and try to have a conversation. Get in front of a recruiter so that your resume is not auto-filtered out because um, it's companies that are willing to kind of have a forward-thinking way of approaching this that are going to start to have behavior change in their organization. It's not doing it the same way we've done it forever, which is give this the technical guy the reins on this. It, it just doesn't work. I think another thing you can do if you're into it is uh, write about it. Yeah. You know, writing good, builds credibility. You know, I, I mean, people ask me, you know, like how, you know, how is it people find you to hire you? And it's like, because I'm published. You know, publishing is a great way to market yourself and your ideas. And that way, you know, when you start handing out a business card and they Google you or you go on LinkedIn, they can see articles you've written about the topic. They're going to care about your thoughts and opinions that you actually bring something to the field rather than, you know, if your resume is not as strong as someone else. Because, but, you know, it's your thoughts and opinions and your passion for it that you bring, especially if it's uniqueness. You know, like I think as a, I went through adult education, you know, um, IDC, you know, lesson design plans, you know, you, you, like they were saying, you bring that to the field and you combine that with your knowledge of uh, psychology, you know, you can bring a lot to the field by talking about it and publishing it. And, and then one last thing that ties in with Robin is um, giving a speech at a conference, um, joining a contest like what we do here, 
those things also get yep. your name out there. I mean, there's so many people yep. <laughs> that have competed in SECTF that were not in the industry at all and now own companies oh, that do social engineering. And second right? place came in, you know, she said she started this less, less than a year ago, didn't yeah. she? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, people always, I literally get this question all the time, aren't you, like, upset that you're creating your own competition? And I'm like, no, because to me, competition is like free salespeople, right? Because yep. the more people out there talking about social engineering makes it, it's not my mission in life. It's all these other people are talking about it, and then everyone else is hearing it, and they're like, hey, maybe we should listen to this social engineering thing. So it, it works, right? Uh, so it, getting involved in some things like that could, could really help you build a uh, reputation that will make it easier for you to find a job within that. So I'm going to ask kind of an interesting, maybe not rabbit trail question, but kind of technical question. Um, I'm familiar with what's called adult learning theory, which is taking a group of people and using facilitated guided discussion to help provide an education model. And um, so it kind of uses the wisdom of the masses and filling in those gaps. Is there anybody doing that for end user training that you've ever seen? Because it's kind of, it, it's longer, but on the other side, it tends to make people engage in the process more. And by all accounts, it looks like that's a very effective means to train somebody. Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's the, I don't know if this is exactly fits the model you're talking but I would say in, um, like, let's use fishing education, yeah. our, uh, our model, and I think you guys follow the same thing, is when you fish people and they get trained, you're not asking them to keep it quiet. Right. So it's this discussion around the water cooler, and then at least with some of our clients, we try to um, incentivize positive by rewarding the positive and training the negative instead of punishing the negative, you know? So uh, in that ins incentivizing and rewarding program, we have some really stupid ones. It could be a small bag of sweetest fish that go out to people who do the right thing every month, right? Um, those incentivizings get people to talk. The talking about it is what's like, oh wait, you know, wait, you, know you, 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 you caught the fish this month and it creates an environment where people want to do the right thing. Um, and one client, we had I mean, literally had like 1,800 people in this one department, and uh, they, they bought a, a, a plush Nemo doll, and they sewed a crown on its head. And the first person to not click and report the fish every month got the Nemo doll at their cube. So it was like, and you would see 1,800 grown adults fighting for the <laughs> stupid stuffed fish at their cube because they were the king or queen fisher for the month, right? And it's, it's really silly. It sounds really silly, but I, it's, in my mind, when you ask the question, it kind of fits that model where now there's a group of people all teaching each other right. and discussing the education because you, you incentivized the, the positive. Perhaps you just described a decentralized adult learning theory model across an entire company. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, Maybe you're, I you're, did. you're looking to shift a social consciousness and social conversation across an organization. Yeah. So I, I actually um, had the idea of a, of a book in my head called Conversational Security Awareness, <laughs> which is just all about the social aspects of it. You mean a different one from the transformational security Yeah, awareness? I mean, I'll stick with the IA also. <laughs> That's, that, that, that's Perry's book that was like, oh, that sounds from, oh, I look over and it's transformational security. Yes. Um, Copyright we trademark. We have another question? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from the Carolinas, so I'll take 115 degrees of dry heat any day. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> over 90 I know, degrees I'm Virginia, and 98 percent humidity. So <laughs> I love this. I, I, my hotel is two miles from here, and I walk there and back every day. It's wonderful. Dear God, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my you question. help. <laughs> uh, my question is this. So I work in um, sales engineering and have for eight or nine years. Um, it, that's 50 percent technical and 50 percent social engineering. It's all about relationships, and it's all about convincing the other person on the other side of the table that you're their friend and that they like you. Um, at the end of the day, and I still haven't gotten over this, so what I'm asking is advice. At the end of the day, it still feels somewhat disingenuous to me because I have good friendships, but none of them are my customers. Uh, my customers are people that I you know, work with and try to help them find solutions. Now, I'm not trying to deceive them at all. I want them to find the best solution for their company. That's my goal. But the relationship, I think it feels lopsided. They feel like we're much better friends than I feel like we are. And so I go out of those meetings and those, those you know, interactions sometimes feeling 
I don't know, just uneven, if you, if you know what I mean. So here, here's what I say you do, because um, I was in a line of work, it could easily be the same thing. I worked with confidential human sources. You know, you know some people call them snitches you know, or whatever you want, but you know, the people I worked with are great patriots. And when I retired, I'm in touch with every single one of them still because they are good friends as well. Because here's the difference. If you take the time during these engagements, you know, you're doing really well. You know, so one thing I always have people do is discover people's strengths, write them down, and then write down the top three priorities of, of every individual you're working with. Because when you take the time to figure out their priorities and you take the time to figure out what their strengths are, you're going to start forming a, a deeper understanding of them and it's going, to stop, it's going to start feeling less lopsided because you actually are understanding them at the same level you understand the other people in your life. Um, and then you're making those human connections. And, 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 when it sell, and when it comes to selling, selling is nothing more than understanding someone else's priorities and offer them resources in terms of those priorities. You know, and so when you understand what their priorities are, it becomes very congruent and it becomes very genuine and very sincere and that's what comes across. And I also think it's, it, if you, and I can't answer this for you and I don't want you to say it here, you know, but if you love your product and you really believe in what it is that you're selling, and you believe that it's going to benefit the person. Right. It's also a reframing mm -hmm. of your thought. Yep. Right. So for me, I am, and my whole team will will admit this. I am the worst salesperson on the planet Earth. I mean, I, I don't even know how to market things that I'm doing presently. Like, I got my team saying, like, yeah, can you mention this more? And I, I, I don't because I always feel like it's self-serving. But um, we just hired a sales engineer, and he says it's the same thing. It's like you got to you got to believe this is the best thing for people. We're actually helping people. We're changing lives. We're making a difference. And if you believe that and it's not fate, then uh, you should be proud to talk about these things, right? You should be proud about it because uh, if you go out to a great restaurant and you have an awesome meal, you're going to tell your, you're going to tell people that, man, I went to this place down the road. It was unbelievable. Why are you not afraid of that? Well, it's the same thing with your product. If you believe it, you love it, your services, then telling people about it and helping people connect with that makes it makes the the frame of your conversations much different gotcha uh, and I, I i agree totally um and i do feel that way i feel like the products that we sell are are the best and they're the best option for our customers um it's the it's the friendship side of it or the yeah. relationship side of it that i that i struggle with because um you know they're they'll tell me all about their kids and their boats and their fishing and their whatever they're doing um and a lot of that stuff i don't care about um, I, I avoid people I know when I see them in the grocery store. I just don't want to talk to them either. And my wife says I'm a hermit. Um, but I yet I work in a sales field, and I have to be a people person. Um, but in but for me, that's not me. Uh, I very much like to not talk to people. Um, but uh, so it's it's kind of a weird. Maybe I'm in the wrong career field, but it's kind of a weird dynamic. But I understand what you're saying, and, and I agree. You know, it's, it's just you know, it's it's really funny though. But what do they see? You're giving them what they need, though, too. That's I mean, right. you're giving them validation. You're talking in terms of their priorities. Mm -hmm. You're giving them choices. You know, so sometimes it will, it will be lopsided just be, you know, because whoever you're engaging, they're obviously deriving great joy and benefit from engaging with you. You're just, you just need to recharge your batteries because you're introverted, yeah. and you need to recharge them somewhere else. Um, I, I wouldn't feel bad about it because, again, you're not, you know, are, are you being a shyster? Are you being manipulative? No. So you're, you're giving them the best you got at, in those moments. It's just you recharge your batteries, not with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. it's, so it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do the same thing. So I, I spend the majority of my career talking to people one-on-one -on -one or in big groups professionally. And if you see me in Walmart, I'll put my phone to my ear so that nobody bothers me or I'll put a set of headphones in um, and look like I'm having a conversation on the phone because I don't have the mental energy to, to deal with that right then. That's exactly how I feel. I yeah. don't have the mental energy to deal with. with right. Business. That doesn't make you a bad person. Don't feel bad about being an introvert. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not an introvert, but um, I will do the very same thing Perry does when I get on a plane. Oh yeah, I, I, I put headphones in because I know for me that if I start a conversation with the person next to me, that three hours is going to be their life story, and I just don't want yeah. it. Well, and I, I, I would much rather save that mental energy for my wife and kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the yes. people that really matter when I'm, you know, when I'm however old I'm going to be and in a deathbed, hopefully not hit by a car. Um, <laughs> then, then I want to be thinking through the investment of time that I had with my family, not necessarily all the uh, the frivolous conversations that with people that have come and gone through my life. And it doesn't make you a bad person because we all have to figure our way to 
to recharge. Got to manage your energy. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I think I saw a guy coming down. Hey, guys. Hi. Over the years, I've had a lot of red teamers suffer from fatigue related mm -hmm. to social engineering specifically. Yeah. I was wondering if you've had any experience with this on your own teams and if you have any tips for how to manage to that. A ton. I've had it a ton. Um, so every type of social engineering has its own stressor. So right now we have a team of people that their main job is vishing. So phone social engineering. And we do pr approximately 200 or so hours of vishing a month. Right for our for our company, so it's not a little bit. We're not talking like six or eight calls a, a, a week, like we're doing six or eight calls an, an hour per person. Um, and what we found before, because I don't experience that fatigue, so um, for me it was like, well, I don't experience it, so everyone should be able to do these things, right? And we were like burning through people like they were paper, and it was like, okay, something something's not going right here. Realizing that. Everyone needs a different, we, there's a conversation, we just had a different way to refresh, to recharge. Uh, what we have done is reduce the amount of hours that, they, that they're allowed to spend vishing to recharge. So you will not ever find a person who their full-time job is vishing because it's too, it's too stressful, it's too much. Um, we, they have to take breaks, they have to go do OSINT or do other things or write or research because it's too mentally draining to do that. Additionally, what we found is the strain of, because like Robin said before, when you're social engineering, you're, you're, you're pretexting, you're being a different person. Your job is to get information from complete strangers. Um, you know, I was, on the, I was doing a vishing call a few months ago and a guy was telling me about some problem he had with his computer. I thought to myself, uh, I can fix this for him. I actually can do it. So I did it. I helped. I walked him through replacing his printer drivers. He was so appreciative. He's like, you're the best IT guy ever. And, now, and then in my head, I'm like, now I'm going to hack you. And I did. And I got his, I got his uh, SharePoint credentials. We used his whole account to um, fish the whole company and put a malicious document on his SharePoint and send it out to the whole company. This guy thought I was his best friend. He invited me to his daughter's wedding shower. When I hung up that phone, I felt like the biggest loser on the planet Earth, right? I mean, this guy was like thanking me and inviting me to a family event that weekend. because You're he thought a very was, bad person. Yes. Uh. <laughs> you know, after that call, I don't, uh. I, don't, I don't go, yes, more hacking. I'm like, I'm going to take a break. You know? <laughs> um, I need to go and maybe drink some whiskey. I know it's 10 a.m. That's fine. You know? But I think it's a long story, and I'm sorry for that. But I think the answer is... Um, allowing your people to tell you when they feel that and then helping them find an avenue to do something else for a short period of time. And I'm not talking weeks, months, but even just a few hours in that day to take a mental break from it because there is a stressor in being a different person and Huge. playing a different role. And if you value your people, you'll give them that ability to do other things so they can recharge, refresh. Yeah, just, just the listening skills alone, when you're listening to elicit, is different than listening for a, a lot of you know, normal relationship stuff. The other thing that I would do is constantly remind them that what they're doing has a greater purpose than them, and it's for a positive purpose. That way you can help them resolve the cognitive dissonance that's probably causing a lot of fatigue on top of that as well. That's a great point. Yeah, it's a very good point because when... Otherwise, there's, you know, we're talking about it's before, that the, dirty there, there's you know, no dopamine yeah. flow and there's no oxytocin. Sarah, I mean, there's no pleasure center in the brain going at all if all you do is that you're thinking you're taking advantage of people. Yeah, and without if, a if people purpose. are experiencing that, then you're, you actually have a, a sociopath and that yeah. could be a bad thing. And, and, you know, that so that's a really great point because I got asked recently um, by a research group, do I think that sociopaths would make better social engineers? And the answer to me is no, 100 percent no. A great social engineer is someone who feels empathy. They, they, they feel that connection with other people. And someone with a large amount of empathy, like, and I know this, I have so many of them on my team, they, they can't just do this eight hours a day, five days a week, and not break. Because if you, if you can, then you're probably not a very empathetic person. So we have to find ways to recharge that empathy center for them, and that, that is group discussions, joking. We, like our, group, our, our corporate chats, I think there's probably like 99% memes. You know, they, I, I think my, my team, they speak in meme. It's a whole language, you know? Um, 
and having their ability to share their successes with each other and creating an environment where it's non-competitive, right? So like my, my, we don't, we don't make the team like compete to see who's the best, but they can share and their success. They share each other's pretext. They, they uh, reward each other with positive comments. Creating that kind of a culture helps them build that empathetic center back up and then they're not um, so drained and tired and feeling bad. Thank you. The, the, the most common feedback I get for the source of the burnout, if you will, is I feel like I'm being disingenuous. Yeah. So I really appreciated what you said earlier yeah, about transparency. And they will burn out from that because there's, there's nothing positive going on in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you combine that with, you know, like you said, you know, being someone you're not, the, the most psychologically strenuous thing I've ever been through, um, the Bureau of the FBI has got a two-week undercover certification school. And it's two weeks of being nothing but someone else. I had to sleep for three days after that, and it wasn't from physical exertion. My brain was exhausted. And so you combine that with no dopamine flowing because you're taking care of someone else in your own mind because you're you know, doing these fishings. That's exhausting, and it's exhausting. Traumatic, on the, traumatic on the system. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Great question, by the way. Okay, so we are hitting just about a little over an hour here, which is a pretty long podcast for us. If you listen to it, you know. So maybe, uh, Perry, just... Um, Tell people about your book and where they can find out more information about you. Sure. Um, so I, I work at Nope. <laughs> so since this we is a podcast, you don't see what's going <laughs> right. on. Robin just propped that up so that the audience can see it. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so the, the book is all around security awareness and security behavior management. It's called Transformational Security Awareness. Uh, if I remember, the subtitle is uh, what neuroscientists storytellers and marketers can teach us about driving secure behaviors. Um, and so it's all about reframing what we mean when we talk about awareness. And, and you know, we're constantly dealing with this fact that uh, there, there's a thing that I call the knowledge intention behavior gap, which is that there's a, a gap between whether somebody knows something and whether they care enough to act on it. And there's actually a gap between even when we care enough to do the right thing, we might not do it because we fall into normal patterns of behavior or we're just we're just human. Um, and so if you've ever had a, a New Year's resolution that's fallen through, you knew the, re the thing that you wanted to do. You knew why it was beneficial, but you just didn't do it. Um, well, security is the same way. A lot of people know the right thing to do, but in the moment, for one reason or another, they don't do it. So this is um, figuring out the, the psychological and the behavioral levers around um, moving that behavior to where you want it to, to go. And so that's available where all fine books are sold. <laughs> um, and then if you want more about me, hit me up on LinkedIn, Perry Carpenter, Twitter, Perry Carpenter, um, and then uh, in, you know anything on No Before. I think I think you should start a new Twitter and call it Penny Carpenter. I should. Well, I'll call Carpenter. it. I'll call it Penny at Vegas. Yeah, Penny. <laughs> and uh, I'll have a whole. I'll good. have a lot more followers than you, I do you, right you now. Will. I'll tell you yeah. that. Vegas. <laughs> you definitely will. And Robin, how can people find out more about your company and and follow you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm easy. Uh, Peopleformula.com, all one word. That's my company. And down there, you have links to uh, lots of videos I do, um, podcasts, and then on Twitter, it's at rdreek, r d r e e k e, and LinkedIn, same thing, Robin Dreek. And uh, you can follow us. Like we have the uh, social en or SOC Engineer Inc. Uh, Twitter account. Mine's Human Hacker. Um, I'm, if I don't say this, my, I think Jay's going to come running over and punch me. We have our SC Village Orlando conference coming up in February of 2020, um, which you will both you will see both Robin and Perry yeah. there because No Before is one of our sponsors for that conference, and um, and Robin is giving a workshop there all about how to profile people and size people up. So. Uh, some really exciting stuff going on. You have a great lineup of folks there, too. Yeah, my, the I got my goosebumps now because this is literally the coolest lineup of people that yeah. are all my friends I've never seen all in one place. It's like that, that Seinfeld episode where the worlds collide. Um, I, some of these guys I've known for like 20 years that are going to be there, and the fact that Chris is able to get us all in one place at the same time, I'm so excited not just to be presenting but also be attending. So it'll be awesome. Yeah, really cool. Like, like I, so I, I met Ian Rowland. He's a guy from the UK who kind of invented the whole study into cold reading. And who trained my team 10 years and ago. That's the part that was cool. <laughs> Andy like, looks like Steve Martin. Yeah, yeah he does. I, yeah. I met him on the had him on the podcast. I, I was a big fan of his his books. And I you know, emailed him along with a few others saying, I'm doing this conference. Would you want to come? And he says, yes. And I tell Robin, hey, I'm having this guy. I'm really excited. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's like, I had yeah, him. I sat in his training class in the <laughs> FBI like 10 years ago. And I'm like, well, that's a small world, right? So he's coming and he's doing a whole day workshop on cold reading. 
Um, Ray said Robin's coming and doing a whole, uh, 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 like three hours on, on profiling. Um, this one, just, I, I honestly, I wish I wasn't running the conference. I want to sit through this one. Joe Navarro is coming and doing a body language workshop. I mean, you, you know, Joe's you, workshops are phenomenal. You can't get train him me. anywhere. I know. Like that guy does like three things a year because he's so busy with lectures and speeches. And he is so, being so gracious. He's like, he, um, oh man, I don't want to ruin it because we just recorded this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay. So he got permission from the government to talk about a process he used in recruiting and it helped him catch three spies with just one technique. He won't tell me what it is. He said, until you come to the conference. That's it. That's what he said. You have to come to the conference and get what it is. And I'm like, you're killing me, man. But uh, you've done that. Um, we, we have Nick Furno coming from the UK also. Uh, okay. He's doing an OSINT workshop. He's amazing. Um, our Paul Wilson, which if you were here, this was really cool. He came because he was doing a show in Vegas. He came to DEF CON and did a live demo of Three Card Monty. Uh, how many people were sitting through that? Right? Were you not guessing and still getting it wrong? I was like, no, I just saw you put the card in the middle. I'm like, how did it move? And then he folded a, a corner of one card. And he's like, now we have the card marked. So now you know where the queen is. Somehow in midair, he unfolded that card and folded another. I'm like, no, no, no. And we had, a, we had a, a GoPro on his hands on the screen. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. And, like, and he was like, I'm going to slow it down a lot here. And he still did it. He's doing that. Uh, Stephanie Paul, she is an actress that is in a lot of like really cool B-rated movies, and she does, does a lot of studies in neuroscience. She's talking about that. Um, uh, Brittany Caldwell is a method actor. She's coming in and doing a whole class on that. And then Amanda Berlin is coming and doing, um, uh, doing a class on um, um, mental health, mental health awareness for people in our community, something that we were talking awesome. about. So it's, a, it's just a ridiculous lineup, you know, to have them all together at one place. The biggest complaint I'm getting, I think it was you, Lee, was saying, I hate it because I don't know what to choose. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But here's, here's what I'm saying. You know, if we can make it successful, these people will all come back next year. I will. And then you can just take, <laughs> you can just take the, the next course then, right? Because so. he, he treats people really well, doesn't he? <laughs> I try. I try. But I come for the food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to bribe them somehow. You know, food, money, hugs, whatever it is. So um, I I'll hope <laughs> to see you guys there in February. Um, I can't thank you enough for this year. This was our 10th year anniversary at DEF CON. This is our 10th year anniversary podcast. And I, 10 years ago, if someone had asked me if this is what we'd be doing, I would have never in my life guessed that 10 years later that we'd be sitting here with this size room with Rob and Dreek you know, talking about this kind of stuff with a team like what I have. So just, just It was just such an amazing journey to know Chris right at the very beginning when after the podcast we get on the phone literally talking about how he wants to put a social engineering class together him and I doing it together, yeah. launching the first one together. He had no employees, no nothing, and him taking any loss. So just so he could give the students great binders, which I still have, <laughs> pens, <laughs> coins. Yet, yet, it's just amazing the amount of passion he puts into everything and brands and who he is as a human being. Taking care of, I mean, I, that's why I come. Anytime Chris asks me to do anything, yes. I don't. You want to think about it? No, don't have to. And then he regrets it after, though. <laughs> we abused you work, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> I've worked hard these last yeah. three days that I haven't in the last year. <laughs> after the first day of the SECTF, he's like, "You're killing so me." So what's tomorrow? And I'm like, "The same thing." And he's like, "Oh crap." <laughs> I'm retired. I don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> I guess got my own company. That's easy. <laughs> but, but it's just been a great ride. Yeah. Ten years, and I, I, I look forward to seeing what what happens in the in the next ten. So thanks for coming out. Uh, you know, we're cleaning up and stuff, but stick around, ask questions, and uh, yeah, see you. Travel safe. Right. Thanks. <laughs>